Okay, it's seven o'clock, so let's get started. I want to welcome all of you to the first lecture of the 66th Menno Simons Lecture Series at Bethel College. I'm Kip Wheedle, Associate Professor of History. The Menno Simons Lecture Series has been bringing distinguished scholars to our campus, usually to speak on topics pertaining to Anabaptist history, theology, or arts, since Roland Bainton arrived in 1953. We're especially excited to welcome our 2018 speaker, who is no stranger to Bethel College. Not only did Rachel Waltner Ghoston graduate from Bethel, she also has generously shared her scholarship with us on previous occasions. Dr. Ghoston is professor of history at Washburn University, where she's been teaching since 2000. She's a prolific researcher of Anabaptist history, gender history, the history of peace activism, and the convergence of any of the combination of the above. This lecture series is, is titled Sexual Identities and Leaders in the Faith, and it begins with tonight's lecture, which is titled Coming Out, Mennonite Leaders Departing. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Waldner Ghost into Bethel College. Thank you, Kip, for the introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening. It's great to be back on the Bethel campus. This is, of course, a place that evokes home for me with memories of my student days here and later working in the Mennonite Library and Archives and then also teaching several history courses here on campus. I'm honored to be part of this Menno Simons lecture series and really grateful to the planning committee for the wonderful hospitality that I've already been experiencing, and also to the Kaufman and Yonke families for sustaining the lectureship endowment, and to all of you, all of you for your presence here tonight. Our topic, sexual identities and leaders in the faith, is historical, and it's also contemporary. Looking over the titles of the past Menno Simons lectures in these brochures, it appears that among all my 65 predecessors, I may have broken a taboo <laughs> by broaching the topic of sexuality. Even though this series, as Kip said, has always focused on Anabaptist Mennonite thought, life, and culture, and sexuality has forever been a part of that. Tonight, through narratives and photographs, I'll be sharing research that I've been doing over the past two years, examining individuals' experiences in Mennonite faith traditions, especially those who have felt a call to ministry and who identify as LGBTQ. Some of them, especially those we'll be considering this evening, have left the Mennonite world or are in the process of doing so. A few of these leaders were expelled. Others left voluntarily, aiming to find more hospitable places to pursue their callings. I want to acknowledge from the outset deep gratitude to the people I have interviewed. The narratives from which I'm drawing are based on oral history interviews. I am grateful to Washburn University and to the University of Kansas, both of which provided research support and funding for this study, particularly last year while I was on sabbatical. The individuals who have participated, more than 30 of them, were not obligated to have their narratives recorded and potentially made public, but they agreed to do so. Early on, for example, I interviewed Erica Lee Simke, who spoke candidly with me about her decision to share her story, not only with me as a historian, but also with journalists interested in the rising phenomenon 
of openly queer pastors in Protestant and evangelical circles. She said, there is comfort in being unsilenced. Another respondent, Krista Taves, who has been a credentialed minister in another denomination for 15 years, but remains close to her Mennonite family and her home congregation told me, thanks for telling these important stories. It has once again felt like I have skin in the game in the Mennonite world, like I have a stake. Virtually everyone participating in this oral history project is theologically trained. Most have seminary background, either master's degrees in divinity or peace studies or related disciplines. A few have done doctoral work in theology and ethics. All of the individuals I'm profiling tonight welcome this scholarship. Paula Northwood, whose Mennonite connection, connections ruptured decades ago, propelling her at that time to a different denominational home expressed with great emotion, when you called me, I felt happy. We want our stories told. Carol Wise, director of the Brethren Mennonite Council for LGBT Interests, explains that it is only very recently that scholars have acknowledged the histories of queer Mennonites and others who identify as Anabaptist. In her view, the academic work conducted in recent years by Stephanie Crable Irma Fast Duick and others to document these lives and this social justice movement is, in quotes, very exciting. It means we've moved into a whole different era. Similar to mainline Protestant denominations as well as Reformed Judaism, progressive Mennonites in North America have created at least some welcoming spaces where it has been possible for queer individuals to come out openly acknowledging and celebrating their sexual identities. Since at least the 1980s, pressure from sexual minorities and their allies has mounted for institutional change toward welcome and acceptance. My study documents that impetus for policies and practices validating queer inclusion, which began with the founding of advocacy advocacy group Brethren Mennonite Council for LGBT Interest. Their logo is here on the slide. They began more than 40 years ago. And this advocacy continues also with the recent activism of the group that calls itself Pink Menno. Over the past decade, it has accelerated with the integration of openly queer pastors into positions of leadership in some Anabaptist congregations here on this continent. The ways in which Mennonites understand and engage with LGBTQ identity have shaped the church, certainly in recent decades. Analogous to how earlier debates in this faith tradition focused on salaried versus lay ministerial positions, divorce, and women in leadership, Mennonite attitudes toward people who identify as queer have come to shape what it means to be a Mennonite leader in the 20th and now also in the 21st centuries. Denominational and congregational guidance itself is now indelibly linked with leaders' own stances toward questions of LGBTQ inclusion. In this lecture series, where I have chosen to focus on a particular set of leaders, I want to acknowledge that the criteria that I placed on whose narratives I would seek out, that is, as I've just said, theologically trained individuals who identify as LGBTQ, provide us with one set of data. It's not an exhaustive and complete research sample, however. Increasingly, I've come to realize that training one's lens on different types of leaders within the Mennonite world, activists who have not gone to seminary, for example, would present us with a more diverse set of narratives. 
Although the material assembled for these Menno Simons lectures presents a predominantly white set of narratives, reflecting no doubt my own academic and church-wide networks and relationships, I want to emphasize at the outset that there is much more scholarship to be done as we analyze systems of power, both at conference levels within Mennonite Church USA, for example, and at the global level within Mennonite Central Committee and Mennonite World Conference, which are other institutions in which LGBTQ, LGBTQ inclusion remains contested. For those of you inclined to embark on historical scholarship, I offer an invitation to collaborate with me and others. This work is still ongoing. For my study, which is North American based, I interviewed 27 LGBTQ individuals and four allies, ranging in age from their mid 20s to age 80. Although this lecture series tonight and continuing tomorrow highlights the experiences of a number of individuals, these are only partial glimpses into complex lives. And I wanna acknowledge that several individuals who participated are not named or profiled because they expressed a desire for confidentiality. In all cases where I do give names and biographical information, these are individuals who have given permission to do so. They've been forthcoming and gracious even as they recount deeply painful experiences, for some linked to their coming of age and for others the result of exclusionary practices, even shaming in institutional settings. At least a quarter of the persons I interviewed noted that as adolescents or adults, they had experienced depression or other forms of mental illness, including thoughts of suicide, accompanied by a sense of isolation and fears of potential rejection among family and church communities if they came out and revealed their sexual identities. For those who experienced these mental health crises during high school or in college or later in young adulthood or some even in middle age, the suffering was not relieved or resolved easily. And in some cases, it stretched on for years. As a result, some of my interviewees are highly motivated to work as pastors or in other professional capacities for LGBTQ justice and in solidarity with younger persons who might be experiencing something similar. One woman explains, since I've come out, I regularly receive emails from folks who say, I'm gay and I'm Christian, or I'm transgender and I'm Christian. And I've been able to have significant, at least twice, life-saving conversations with folks, mostly young adults, because I'm a pastor, because I'm serving the church, and because I'm out. Another who writes and speaks regularly about seeking justice with North American Mennonite institutions points out that queer church leaders have to think about what's our responsibility to LGBT kids. Although I began this study with the idea that I would be focusing exclusively on the phenomenon of out-migration from Mennonite institutions and the losses of LGBTQ ministerial leaders to other faith traditions, my research discoveries quickly presented a more complicated, nuanced, and interesting story. Yes, there are leaders who have left, but the boundaries of Mennonite denominations are permeable and malleable and have been shifting over time, especially in the last decade. Among my interviewees are some women and men in their 60s and 70s who decades ago came out of the closet and as a result lost ministerial positions because of hostility to their sexual identities. 
They then embarked on journeys into other faith traditions. Those journeys were often accompanied and, or, or complicated rather by losses in their lives, not only of professional posts and reputations, but sometimes losses of marriages and family support. Now more recently, some of these individuals have reconnected with Mennonite congregations, conferences and institutions to exercise leadership once again in what has quite recently evolved into a smaller and somewhat more progressive Mennonite Church USA denominational body. So there are some reconciliation stories among the mix. By considering these individuals' experiences from a cross-denominational perspective, we see that staying Mennonite is not necessarily the most critical or even most desirable outcome for some LGBTQ faith leaders. They can and do thrive in other denominations. And many of them continue to identify in various ways, culturally, theologically, and through continued contacts as Anabaptist Mennonites, even while serving in other denominational settings. This pattern, which appears again and again in the oral history narratives, throws into question assumptions about what it means to be Anabaptist or Mennonite in the first place. Often, this is a label that's associated with church membership. That is, a Mennonite is someone who belongs to a Mennonite church. And yet this assumption runs counter to the lived experiences of many of these people who embrace and assert Anabaptist Mennonite identity and theological tenets, even while the exclusion of queer people remains a contested lodestar for church membership and leadership within denominational institutions. Building on the work of historians Gillian Frank, Bethany Morton, and Heather White, my aim with this scholarship is to consider the relationships between religious and sexual identities, particularly within progressive Mennonite contexts, and even as leaders have left the Mennonite fold to investigate how religious actors and institutions over time helped shape the contours of sexual liberalism and have continued to create additional spaces of welcome in Mennonite denominations and institutions. A subtext of tonight's presentation is, what might the Christian community learn from those in our congregations, colleges, church structures who identify as LGBTQ and have moved on to other faith traditions? Toward the end of tonight's presentation, I'll suggest some possible conclusions. But first, I'll offer brief profiles of seven of these individuals who in some form or another left the Mennonite world, though not completely. Through these narratives, individuals who have been part of my study narrate elements of their own lives in their own words. All of them are out in terms of their sexual identity. They identify variously as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer. Some have painful memories of Mennonite decision-making that ousted them from productive work that they were engaged in in leadership positions. And some have one foot yet in the Mennonite world, but are expecting to pursue ordination and ministry elsewhere. The out-migration of some leaders, pastors, theologians, chaplains, church administrators, has happened over a number of years, and it is an aspect of Mennonite life that has not been generally acknowledged or publicized. It is also part of a broader phenomenon in faith communities of LGBTQ identity and religious calling in which people of many backgrounds have journeyed to use their gifts where they are free and welcome to do so. Although I am interpreting this research in a specifically Mennonite context, I wanna emphasize that the patterns emerging here regarding sexual identities and leaders in the faith are not unique to Mennonites. 
historically, queer people, including pastors and pastoral candidates, being excommunicated or rejected or otherwise discouraged from pursuing their callings is not limited to Mennonites, nor are stories of welcome and inclusivity, which is also a significant part of this story, limited to Mennonites. That is, Mennonites are not exceptional. By considering the lives of spiritually inclined leaders, it becomes apparent that LGBTQ history and Mennonite history, when intertwined, are not only about loss and expulsion. Consider, for example, the kinds of ministries these individuals have had in other faith, sittings, uh, faith settings to which they've migrated. LGBTQ leaders have been intentional in engaging with marginalized populations in neighboring and surrounding communities. As one of them told me, quote, I'm glad that orda ordination is becoming more accessible for queer people, but that's not the be all and end all. Queer justice would revolutionize our church. It would revolutionize society. It's all connected in the sense that we encounter the intersections of sexism and racism and classism every single day. Krista Tave, shown here, who serves several Unitarian Universalist congregations in the Midwest, points out, quote, it's not the role of the oppressed to undo other people's oppressiveness. Our responsibility is to survive and thrive. For her, as for many of the people I interviewed, social justice work is at the forefront from anti-poverty initiatives to the Black Lives Matter movement. Krista, whose roots are in a Mennonite family and congregation in Ontario, Canada, was pastoring a Unitarian Universalist congregation in St. Louis a few years ago at the time of the police shooting of Mike Brown in Ferguson. From that time on, she worked closely with other clergy and community leaders to challenge white racism. She says she's honored to be part of a study about LGBTQ people who left the Mennonite church and are serving as religious leaders in other faiths what it means to be Mennonite and Unitarian Universalist is a constant theme in my spiritual journey, she says. I am fully both. Although most of the personal narratives that I'm highlighting this evening are from the past decade, this one reaches back more than 30 years. Paula Diller Lehman, born and raised in Ohio, who lived here in central Kansas in the 1980s and 90s, is now known as Paula Northwood. In 1994, she was the well-regarded and longtime youth ministries leader and an editor of With Magazine for Mennonite Youth in the General Conference Mennonite Church. Paula was ordained to co-pastor Faith Mennonite Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota with her husband. But after years of being closeted, and finally, as she says, being convicted by my own preaching about living with integrity, she was out and ousted. Subsequently, Northern District Conference officials asked that she relinquish her ministerial credential which she challenged. It has taken her a while to build her life back, but in the past two decades, she has earned a doctorate of ministry degree and she's moved on denominationally. Currently, she is in her 16th year in ministry with Plymouth Congregational Church in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. Her title is Acting Senior Minister but at the time that she left Faith Mennonite in the mid-1990s, she remembers, quote, I was devastated. I lost my job. I lost my spiritual community. I felt like I lost my whole family. Now, decades later, she is thriving, and her perspective is nuanced. 
The thing that being forced out of the Mennonite church has done for me, she says, is open my eyes to other denominations, the UCC, the American Baptists that are doing good work in the world. She adds, I consider myself ethnically a Mennonite and consider myself theologically an Anabaptist. Had I not come out and left it, I think I would have con uh, continued to aspire to do great things in the Mennonite church. Sarah Clausen, who last year accepted a position pastoring a Disciples of Christ congregation in Columbia, Missouri, critiques the cultural baggage of Mennonite denominationalism. Professors and friends at Vanderbilt Divinity School, as well as her introduction there to black liberation and queer theology, sent her, she says, looking for people to share something besides ethnic identity or Mennonite denominational institutions. If we can get away from those kinds of things, it just makes sense that I'm part of this local disciples congregation, which is a peace church, which does social justice work that prioritizes service. I learned at Vanderbilt that there's not one thing wrong with me or my sexual orientation. All that's wrong is wrong with the church. And I developed great confidence around that. She continues, that's a great gift of my coming out from the denomination. I wouldn't be able to see or think these things if I had just found my Mennonite church and been called and had my loyalty to the Mennonite denomination. Now as an outsider, and a person with feet in a lot of different places, I don't have a vested interest in upholding structures for their own sake. Reuben Sankin Marks is a young chaplain in Indianapolis. He has been ordained in the Disciples of Christ denomination after having grown up in a Mennonite family at First Mennonite Church of Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. As a young gay man intending to complete seminary studies, he was stunned to find out that if he wanted to become a candidate for openings in MCUSA congregations, he would have great difficulty. He learned from a denominational official that at that time, this was in 2014, MCUSA was not processing Mennonite Leadership Inquiry Applications, or MLIs, as they're known, to out gay individuals. The denominational official, Nancy Kaufman, encouraged him to be patient and to finish seminary studies. But Reuben heard this as an outrageous barrier that Mennonite denominational officials would only help him as a candidate if he did not identify as LGBTQ. He had been out since high school. He reasoned that he couldn't go back in the closet. At that particular time, from the period 2013 to 2017, MCUSA officials were not processing the ministerial leadership inquiry applications of openly queer candidates, even though the denomination had done so prior to 2012. Reuben was deeply unhappy to learn about this policy directive. He was also aware that other LGBTQ individuals in the denomination, Theta Good in Colorado, for instance, who had recently embarked on the ministerial credentialing process within Mountain States Mennonite Conference, were taking public stances regarding their call to ministry. Reuben wrote about his incredulousness at the denomination's unpublicized, unheralded decision to stop processing openly queer candidates' applications. His essay appeared in a blog post that he gave an edgy title, Being Forced Out of the Church, and it spread rapidly through social media. This was in 2014. As a result, many Mennonites became aware of this don't ask, don't tell policy in the denomination. His public critique prompted significant activism among inclusive pastors and other allies in Mennonite Church USA who viewed the new policy as discriminatory. Recently, in 2017, 
that policy on the handling of portfolios of openly queer pastoral candidates has been rolled back, essentially reversed. And I will talk more about that uh, policy tomorrow night uh, in my lecture Monday evening. Thus far, we've spoke of faith leaders living in the United States. But Mennonite structures in the US have parallel denominational partners elsewhere in North America, including Mennonite Church Canada. And a half dozen leaders I interviewed are Canadians. One is Svinda Heinrichs, a pastor credentialed to ministry with the United Church of Canada. She grew up in a Mennonite family at Toronto United Mennonite Church. Her father was an architect who designed the housing community where she grew up among other Mennonite families in that community. Her faith formation, she recalls, was strong in her growing up years. At age 17, she came out as a lesbian and left the Mennonite Church for a time, although she gradually sensed a call to ministry and remained close to her family. My parents, she says, were supportive of me my whole life. I came out over 30 years ago. In my family, if I brought someone home to dinner, they were welcome. She jokes, my dad wanted me to meet a Mennonite boy. Instead, I got a Mennonite pastor. She's referring to Marilyn Zare, her partner, who served for eight years as pastor at Toronto United Mennonite Church and recently left that position after coming out as a lesbian. Spinda pursued her training at United Church Seminary Emmanuel at Toronto Theological School and hoped to become a Mennonite pastor. But by 2005, she says, I knew that the Mennonite Church would not ordain me. The next year, she joined the United Church of Canada and has pastored congregations in Ontario for more than two decades. Her LGBT identity is at the forefront. She notes that in moving around from uh, church position to church position, as she has done in 20 years, in all my interviews with churches, I've been out. I've never gone back in the closet. I'm a lesbian. I say so in the first 10 minutes. But much as she has appreciated her adopted church home, she says, I feel like a denominational refugee. She continues, the refugee metaphor seems apt because I had to leave. I wasn't going to flourish in Mennonite contexts. The Mennonite church's loss is the United Church's gain. I watch what's going on in the Mennonite church, but it's not where I have to make my home. It confirms for me again that leaving was absolutely, for me, the right choice. A few minutes later, she adds as a postscript to our interview, I wonder what we would have done in the church if we'd been allowed to stay. There's a whole generation that's just gone. Marilyn Zare, shown here in the rainbow stole, is Spinda's wife. She speaks of her coming out quite late in life at the age of 50 as a Damascus Road experience. She says, I finally let the truth in. It took a long time for me to be ready for that cracking open because I knew everything would change. About her sexual orientation, she says that this is true. And when I knew it, I couldn't unknow it. She is hoping to retain her Mennonite credentials as a minister and spiritual director, uh, director in the Mennonite Church Eastern Canada Conference, even though this summer she covenanted to pastor three rural congregations of United Church of Canada in northern Ontario, where she now lives. What conclusions can we draw from these narratives? As we'll see tomorrow, Fewer leaders are currently leaving Mennonite Church Canada and Mennonite Church USA as more congregations have become welcoming in recent years to LGBTQ pastors and gradually more job opportunities become available to ministerial candidates.
Whereas some older leaders, Paula Northwood and others, were essentially forced out of jobs a generation ago, younger ministers are weighing their options and some are managing to stay. These changing circumstances must surely be a bittersweet evolution from the perspective of Mennonite individuals who years ago felt called to ministry but were certain there'd never be a place for them because of their sexual orientation. Russ Schmidt is an example, a Central Kansas native. He overlapped with me as a student here at Bethel. In this photo, Russ is second from left, holding the comforter complete, completed at a fall retreat of First Mennonite Church in San Francisco. His earliest memory is from the age of four. In the 1960s, he told his family based out in Gossel, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a preacher. By 1980, when he graduated from this campus from Bethel, I was very closeted, he remembers. And he joined Mennonite Voluntary Service in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he then came out to several friends. As a young gay man, he knew that Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana, would not accept him as a potential ministerial candidate. So in 1982, he headed for an alternative choice, Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, and after completing his theological degree, he trained to become a nurse, and that has been his profession. For three decades, Russ has lived and worked in the Bay Area. I consider myself Mennonite and a Baptist. Yes, absolutely, he says, and it's on my terms. At First Mennonite Church of San Francisco, I've done nearly everything in the church. I'm one of the old timers now. I've been the local coordinator for Mennonite Voluntary Service, interim pastor, and on different leadership teams, and occasionally I preach. I'm not at all invested in being licensed or ordained, but I'm a lay leader. Rush Schmidt's narrative can be read as a reconciliation story, but it's also one of loss of roads not pursued because of sexual identity and barriers within Mennonite institutions for people sensing calls to ministry. As the Canadian writer Alicia Duick Reed points out in her book, Negotiating Sexual Identities, only relatively recently have Mennonites attached themselves openly to LGBTQ identities, and yet there have always been a diversity of bodies, genders, desires, and sexual practices in the history of Mennonites. I'll conclude by reiterating a theme I mentioned earlier, that these narratives offer lessons for our communities about nurture and call within congregations, colleges, and church structures, about the barriers often erected against those who identify as sexual minorities. And there are also lessons here to be gleaned about barriers removed, about grace and sustenance as leaders pursue their gifts. At this juncture, we can make at least three observations. First, leaders who have been expelled from Mennonite institutions or have who have departed in response to discriminatory policies have accessed new church worlds that are more welcoming and there's evidence that they are thriving in those multiple contexts. Second, many of them have developed layered ideological, a theological identities through which they continue to embrace Anabaptist Mennonite tenets and practices bringing those with them into other denominational contexts. They may have been ostracized and hurt deeply by institutional and administrative policies by Mennonite people and Mennonite churches, but they nevertheless have carried along strains of Anabaptists with them even after they left the Mennonite fold. And third, some of these ministerial leaders are finding their way back to reconnect with Mennonites 
after years, even decades away from the denomination. Tomorrow, we'll consider several such reconciliation stories among pastors and congregations in both the US and Canada. These narratives indicate transformation in Mennonite contexts, a convergence of once breakaway leaders within Mennonite bodies coming back into influence again and pushing denominational structures into more inclusive directions. These individuals' experiences accessible through oral history together with their implications for denominationalism and Anabaptist Mennonite identity suggest some shifting grounds in recent church history. And I hope that in the time remaining, we can further explore some of these themes through your comments and questions. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Uh, Rachel, in this talk, your sample was kind of weighted towards out lesbians. Uh, I wonder if that's just accidental or if mm -hmm. they are more visible. Mm -hmm. if, could you talk a little bit about differentialities between okay. lesbian and gay male issues here? Yeah, thanks. Um, probably the, the weightiness is because when I began this uh, project two years ago, I was particularly interested in looking at women's experiences in the broader Mennonite church, and um, that's because I had previously been working on a, a long project around sexual abuse issues, and that many of the people I had come to know who'd been through seminaries and theological training had had the desire, they had felt called to ministry, but it seemed that um, the Mennonite institutions often were patriarchal enough and maybe even hostile enough to them that they had gone to other uh, vocational paths that they maybe in, in originally thought they'd become a pastor or a chaplain or a theologian, but they had ended up doing other things. And I, so I really wanted to see where women were going since women pastors in the church seemed to be fewer than we might have had had this been a very openly inclusive uh, faith tradition. So it, it, it sort of came out of my own interest to seek out women. Um, but then I, uh, about a year into the project, it seemed to me silly to not be also engaging with um, gay men or men who identify as queer or, or bisexual. Uh, and so I broadened out at that point. Um, and so tomorrow, actually, I think probably it won't, for people that can either attend in the convocation in the morning, lecture at 11, or tomorrow evening, it maybe won't seem quite this, this weighted. Uh, but I did decide I would try to interview anybody who is theologically trained, who would be willing to speak to me, who identifies variously as LGBTQ. And one of the things I did in my interviews was to ask each person, how do you identify? What is an appropriate, what's a, what's a sensitive label? Maybe label's not the right word, but what's a sensitive way to be called so that I don't you know, make assumptions? And so um, some people, especially some of the older women, use the term lesbian, as I, f I found in talking with especially younger people in their 20s and 30s. Uh, the term queer often came up much more frequently and was much more embraced by, by younger folks. And in, in terms of the LGBTQ, um, uh, that sort of catch-all term I've used, it's a bit problematic um, in terms of T, trans, because in this uh, sample that I was looking at, at uh, seminary trained folks, I actually was able to connect with only one person who is a trans person. So most of the folks that I interviewed would say that they're gay, they're lesbian, they're queer. That's the, that's the majority of my sample. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a little off topic for you because we, it's something we talked about this morning after church. Uh, both the Bethel College Mennonite Church and the Wichita Church, the Lorraine Avenue Church, have welcoming statements in their, 
as part of their of their creed and their faith. Uh, do you know how many other Mennonite churches in North America have such a thing? Uh, I don't know the number. I know that that numbers of churches that have those statements of inclusivity, clear and even naming inclusive of people regardless of sexual orientation, those numbers are on the increase. And um, the one person that I had a conversation with that matter about was Carol Wise from Minneapolis, who is the director of um, the Brethren Mennonite Council for LGBT Interests. And she says that both within the Brethren denomination, another Anabaptist denomination, and the Mennonites, um, churches, not just uh, you know urban, smaller churches in college towns, <laughs> are including those statements now, but a wider variety, both larger churches and also some smaller churches, um, even in rural areas, in recent years have, um, have been incorporating those statements. But of course, it's not a majority, and it's not near a majority. So uh, advocacy groups like uh, the Brethren Mennonite Council are always looking to work with congregations who are wanting to go through the process. But one thing I learned about um, in this research is that once a congregation becomes even a part of the uh, welcoming or supportive network or maybe puts a statement like that in their bulletin or on their website, the work isn't done, right? So I, that, that was really um, such an important learning for me in this that congregations that really want to walk with people wherever they are and, and are coming in from having been very marginalized, either around sexual orientation or disability or what, whatever it may be, there is work to be done for, you know, even thinking about the nurture of children in that, in that congregation, um, children of, of queer folks and so forth. So I so appreciate that question because uh, there's lots of work yet to do and I don't know the number. I know it's increasing but not anywhere near majority. You have mentioned uh, brethren as well as Mennonite. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, a significant difference between the way these two churches have dealt with this issue? Carol Wise is uh, brethren, and, and a few of my interviewees also are brethren, although the, the majority of my interviews are, are Mennonite. Uh, Carol told me that in the brethren tradition, it tended to be initially uh, larger congregations, I think maybe connected with, with uh, colleges, brethren colleges, who were the quickest to come on board, and she said that was not true of the Mennonites. Um, and so she, she would be able to give some analysis about that. But uh, they continue, this is of course an organization that has long had a newsletter, they have a website presence, they're always looking to partner with any any group within uh, the Anabaptist uh, uh, denominations that, that want to, to at least pursue and, and begin thinking of, about this. Uh, tomorrow I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, structures even outside of North America, I'm thinking about Mennonite World Conference and Mennonite Central Committee, um, and also about queer leaders in Anabaptist uh, churches outside of North America and Europe and, and in the Global South. So although my study has been really focused on North America, I'm becoming more and more aware there are lots of people um, that have these conversations um, or will be having these conversations in the generations to come globally. So of course this is not just a North American topic. Do you have any history and knowledge of the Anabaptists from the 15th and 16th century and a long time ago, rather than just the current? You mean in terms of sexual identity? Yes. Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think it is a, a challenge for historians to really know a lot about sexual identity for 
um, any subjects that they might choose to study, certainly before the 19th century. It's not impossible, but it is more challenging uh, because a lot of times sexual practices were not talked about nearly to the extent that sexual practices and policies are codified in these days. So my answer, uh, in, in terms of like leaders, Anabaptist leaders, the answer is no. also ask, <clears throat> ask for comments. Sure. We have been privileged to live in a town of, that had a very progressive college, that is Grinnell College, uh, where we learn to know and we have very good friends among this community, LGBTQ. Uh, also, we have been able to be on Cape Cod a great deal and know many uh, people in this, in this realm. And I c what strikes me is the openness, the vitality, the creativeness, the graciousness these people have when they are permitted to come out and move freely in society. Thank you. I too have been very involved with the LGBT community. And one comment that they have made is that uh, they don't like always being identified as a gay man or I mean, the gay term is sort of used universally or a gay woman. They are not identified by gay, they are a man. And in the field of education, when we have a child with disability, we don't call them a disabled child. We call them a child with a disability. And they don't like to be identified specifically that way. Thanks. I completely agree. It's important to ask. In my case, I was talking with adults, not with children. But to ask adults how do they want to be called and then to respect that. So thank you for that point. I'm wondering about uh, the numbers of congregations. On the one hand, it's very encouraging to me that the number of congregations that are becoming welcoming is, is increasing. And on another level, I have a sense that the number of congregations who are closing and leaving the MCUSA and that the number of those, and have left, say, Western District. Mm -hmm. I mean, one can quickly name a, a number of congregations. I don't know that this issue is the main issue, but it probably is. Uh, but just recently, we heard about the Southeast Conference. Mm -hmm. And think of all of those congregations. So, the, the, what does that mean for the future of our polarized denomination? Mm -hmm. That's a good question for uh, everybody who's part of Mennonite Church USA and these regional conferences, Western District here, but the, the other conferences around to continue to, to grapple with. Um, that's not something that's gonna be settled in these Minnow Simons lectures. Um, but, but clearly, uh, in earlier years, issues like women in leadership tended to drive conservative folks out. You know, there's a history of, especially at the conservative edges of Mennonite bodies, for people to, s to split away. Um, not too long ago, I had a chance to read the history of the, the Germantown 
Mennonite Church, which is located in North Philadelphia. And if, if you don't know about Germantown, it's the oldest Mennonite congregation in North America. And, you know, that's an interesting case study because in the 1990s, uh, probably 1980s as well, but certainly by the 1990s, Germantown was a dual affiliated congregation. Uh, they were affiliated with, I believe it was Franconia Conference, but also with the Eastern District Conference of the General Conference Mennonite Church. And because Germantown was inclusive of LGBT members, there the issue at that time in the 90s wasn't so much you know, pastoral leadership, what I've been focusing on here, it was on just members in that congregation. They were disciplined first in the 1990s by one of their regional conferences, and then by 2001 by Eastern District Conference. And although they did not want to leave those conferences, they were expelled. They were expelled out of those conferences. And so when they wanted to join MCUSA, Mennonite Church USA, which was coming to gather by 2002, they were not permitted to come in because they didn't have a regional conference identity anymore. And so they have continued to move, you know, keep on keeping on. They're an Anabaptist Mennonite congregation that is completely independent. They're not part of MCUSA, and it's not because they didn't want to be. It's because they were um, expelled. So I, I think if we think about these things in terms of people choosing to leave, it's also sometimes people are, are, are put out as well. It's, we have to think of that in, in both ways. So I, I grant your point, Jim, we have to be thinking about the future of MCUSA, but I also think that people have been leaving and been maybe disengaging in MCUSA and regional conferences for a long time because they see it as unten untenable to not be inclusive of, of queer folk. So it's, it's both and. It's, it's not just to look at one, one side of sort of bleeding out. Maybe you mentioned this, but how many uh, people of color were among your interviewees? I interviewed um, I interviewed one person of color. I would like to interview many more people of color. And I have come to realize that by limiting my definition of leaders to seminary trained leaders, that there are lots and lots of leaders, people of color, who need to be part of this study. So in that, that is one way in which this study is still a work in, in progress. I'm not finished. So thank you for the question. It's a good question. Okay, I don't see any more hands. Um, well, let's thank Rachel for sharing time with us. And you're all invited to join us tomorrow twice. First at 11 a.m. for the, the convo address, and then again at 7 p.m., both times right here. And there will be a reception in the evening following the, the 7 p.m. lecture. Thank you. <laughs>